Hello. Hopefully we'll still have some, some people trickling in and hopefully you can all hear me. I am Emilia and I'm here from Demco. I see Kelsey waving, so I'm assuming that audio sounds good. Uh, I will be moderating today and I'm very, very excited that all of you are joining us. We had some, some great registration numbers. We're excited about this. Just a few housekeeping things. Kelsey has a lot of information to share, as you can imagine. Uh, there's a lot, it's, it's a huge topic to try to tackle. She's gonna cover it you know, as best she can. We're gonna let her run with it. So if there isn't time for questions at the end, we will take a note of them. There's also information on the slide and you'll see it at the end as well to connect with her on social media. You're also welcome to connect with Demco with any of your questions. This webinar is being recorded. And all registrants, even if you drop off, even if you, well, if you registered and didn't dial in, you probably can't hear me right now, but you'll all be getting this email. Uh, I think it'll be coming about a week, so not immediately. And it will have a link to watch the recording. It will have a link to resources. We'll also be posting it on our Demco site, so you can find it anytime if you lose the email. So fear not if something comes up and you need to jump off of this webinar you'll be able to access all of the information that we're getting today. And we do have another webinar scheduled with Kelsey for April 27th, so please save the date. Keep an eye out, there will be an email that comes out to register for that one as soon as that registration is available. So without further ado, I, I want to introduce Kelsey Bogan. She probably does not need an introduction to this crowd. I think that's, her name is probably the reason that a lot of you are here. But Kelsey is a library media specialist with a master's in library and information science. She was a high school librarian, an adjunct professor, and a professional speaker and presenter who loves helping librarians to, to leverage the power of social media for their library's advocacy, uh, to build their collection development, their outreach, and their community efforts. And she is an advocate for reform in the library profession, especially as it relates to outdated collection organization and development traditions. So her information for connecting her on her on her Twitter at Kelsey Bogan or on her blog, if you have uh, checked it out, definitely check it out, don't use shushme.com. So welcome, Kelsey. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're really excited to have you share on dynamic shelving. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um... Should we should we start? Is it time? Yeah, I think I think we can definitely start. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This was, I hope, going to be a fun webinar because it's just really talking about a lot of the fun parts of our job, you know, the merchandising and marketing and promotion of our resources. So uh, I hope that you'll leave with inspiration and also some practical tips you could just kind of use right away. Mm -hmm. Um, those are my favorite kinds of webinars to attend <laughs> when you leave with some real practical, I can do this now, you know. Uh, so dynamic shelving, um, creating accessible and independently navigable collections, that's going to be kind of the main focus. And so I'm going to be tying kind of everything back to that because that's really the kind of primary goal that at least I have for um, trying this kind of different focus of shelving that I've been trying in the last several years. So for the agenda for today, we are going to kind of, it's kind of three parts, the web, uh, the slides, and you will have access to the slides. So you'll see that I have things linked on some of the slides and you'll be able to um, have access to those links and such. So um, after afterwards, you will have that. Um, so we will be doing it in three parts, kind of what is dynamic shelving um, and then how to do it all the practical tips and pictures and all that stuff. And then we'll end with just a little bit about why to try it or that kind of advocacy piece. If there are stakeholders you need to convince first, you know, some of that part might be helpful for that um, kind of explaining why, why, why try it. So um, I'm going to just show you, so you could just see what um, some of our shelves look like in our library. So I'm just gonna play this video really quickly just so that you can kind of have the, set the stage and you can envision what I'm talking about. And then we'll have lots and lots of pictures throughout as well. Morning comes and you know that you wanna stay. Oh, that started not in the, not in the beginning for some reason. Welcome to 
Okay, so that's what our fantasy section looks like in the library. Um, and this is kind of what most of our library looks like. So let's talk about why and what, what I'm doing here. So what is dynamic shelving? All right, this is my we're only wordy display um, slide. Most of the rest of them have lots of pictures, um, but this is kind of my elevator pitch de definition. You know, for me, dynamic shelving is just a philosophy, really, of um, embracing flexibility and like a marketing mindset in our library organization strategies. The purpose of which is so that we can provide collections that are more accessible and independently navigable to the average library user. So. It's really to help us demystify the library and to remove barriers of access that are really common within traditional and I would say archaic library organizational systems. You know, as we work through this, you'll start to see how a lot of the things I try are intended to solve, you know, barriers of access problems that I've encountered and my students have encountered. And so that's really the purpose. So you know, dynamic shelving is more of an approach or a philosophy um, of flexibility and just like keeping promotion of resources in mind rather than like a really strong, rigid kind of control of organization. So more flexible really is kind of what it is. So this is my favorite slide in the whole presentation. <laughs> it's really a vibe, not a set of rules. So I don't want people to be like seeing all these things that I do and that I try and be thinking like um, stressing out and thinking like, oh my gosh, I, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do all of those things or how, you know, who has the time or whatever. I don't want you to be stressing like that this is a set of rules that to do dynamic shelving, you need to do X, Y, and Z. It's just really more of a philosophy or a vibe. It's like opening yourself up to this more flexible approach to how you're organizing your resources and prioritizing your choices as what you can do to make your resources more accessible and more you know, independently navigable to your, to your community. And so there's gonna be different things that will work for you that don't work for other people and, and so forth. So it's really just more about like opening yourself up to moving away from the old school rigid rows of spines in perfect A to Z order, you know, just being kind of open to trying some other things that might work for your community. So this is kind of, you know, the vision of like the traditional library. This is the this is what the library looked like when I inherited it. Um, it was really um, very crowded shelves, <laughs> very crowded shelves, uh, minimal signage, very, very little signage. Um, so like even when kids were browsing the shelves, they didn't really know what they were looking at. You know, am, what am I looking at here? Um, you can see there's not much direction for them. There's no covers, you know, so they really can't even tell what they're looking at or what the books are about. Spines are all in rows, but you know, all of the library stickers cover a lot of the important information on the spine. So you're not able to really access the title that well or the author. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, the traditional approach that, you know, libraries really did use for a very long time. And then this is kind of the before and after for some of my shelves. So you could see the Fiction section A to Z spines out. This was how it was. And then this is more of like what I consider to be more or more dynamic, less static approach. So we're gonna dig into all the actual specific, you know, techniques here and all of that stuff. So before I get into it, I do want to say I, I'm just not the kind of presenter who can take questions mid-presentation because I just get too uh, distracted and I won't finish the presentation. So we're just going to save questions for the end, but feel free to put them in the chat or to discuss in the chat. And we will be trying to get to at least some questions at the end of this. Um, so please do feel free to do that. But just know I, I'm not ignoring you. I just I will get totally off task if I try to take questions in between slides. All right. So implementing dynamic shelving. So hopefully this will be the part that um, gives you a lot of concrete examples and sort of um, practical suggestions for how you can actually start trying this stuff. So I kind of think of the way I implement dynamic shelving as having um, sort of four generally distinct um, or uh, I guess strategies or subcategories. So we're gonna do a couple of these today. 
Um, so in shelf techniques, you know, we're going to talk about what you do on the shelf um, to try to change up the spines out kind of approach. Eye catchers is another one we might be able to talk to about today. And that's like the things you add to the shelves to make them or that you add to the books to make them kind of speak a little more loudly. Um, signage and directionals and chunking or organization are also big parts of what I consider to be dynamic shelving for me, but we will probably not get to these today, but these are, we're gonna talk about these in the next presentation in April. So in April, we're gonna be getting into um, a lot of the bigger organizational changes you might wanna make to your library. Mm -hmm. So today is gonna be more on the smaller, um, the smaller things. So kind of where you could start. All right, so let's start with in-shelf mm -hmm. techniques. Okay, <laughs> in-shelf dynamic shelving strategies. So when I started um, to reimagine how to approach um, organizing our library, you know, I was really just watching students browse and I was just kind of taking note as to what was and wasn't working for them. Also trying to keep track of the common questions I was being asked and letting that kind of drive you know, the decisions of trying new things. So when it came to the fantasy and sci-fi sections in particular, I was seeing a lot of the same barriers to access. When you have these um, books in rows of spines, at least for us, students were having a hard time being able to tell which were standalones versus which were parts of series. And if it is part of a series, is this book one in the series? Um, you know, because you think about how technically the correct way of shelving is that you have it by author first and then alphabetical by title within the author group. Um, so that doesn't really allow for series books to be together and in order. So when you have a, an author like Rick Reardon, um, you know, it has many different series. If you're doing them title alphabetical, then that's very, it's a huge barrier of access for students that are trying to read just one series at a time. So I was kind of noticing that they were really struggling with the series and with being able to just tell, like, sometimes they just wanted a standalone. And we would have lots of students ask, like, do you have any fantasy books that are just standalones? You know, so taking note of these barriers of access, looking for these common questions and these common sort of browsing issues kind of led me to trying out stacking in the shelves. So stacking is one of the strategies I really like. I'm especially big fan of it in areas that are very series heavy. So in my opinion, stacking works particularly well and successfully when you're in a section with a lot of series. I think it's a really great solution for series um, organization. And it does sa save some shelf space too, because if you flip the books of uh, the series on its side and stack it up and then put book one in front of it, then you can kind of get sometimes a little bit more out of your shelf space than having them all in a line. So that can help as well. But visually, it just helps the browser be able to tell, okay, here's a tiny chunk of four books by the same author. This is a series. Book one is the one that's displayed in front of the others, slightly in front of the others, right? Or sometimes I put them on top, depending on how tall the stack is. Um, you can see that I also use series labels, which I very much wish our, <laughs> our um, library management system would like have a button for producing those on your own, but I hand type them. But it's worth it because ever since doing the stacking and adding the series labels, we have almost never do students ever has to have to ask me anymore. Is this, which series is this book in? Which number in the series is this book? Um, does this author, is this all one series or is this two? So this is kind of what I mean about addressing barriers to access. Sometimes it's little things, but it can make a big difference to the browser. So stacking is definitely something that you can try and it works really well with duplicates as well. So if you're a librarian like me that tends to buy more copies and fewer titles of things, um, then it, stacking works really nicely for that too. And I don't know why this is, but at least with our teenagers, <laughs> having two or three of the same book stacked with one on top seems to indicate to them that it's popular or good and they tend to my students tend to check out the books that are that we have duplicates of before often before they take the ones we have singles of so i don't know if that's a human nature thing or a teen nature thing or just our school but it's interesting um so you can see this is really good it's also quite helpful for um 
quick collection development checks like because when you take a glance at a bookcase that has stacks and you see you'll be able to easily see which series have the first book missing so like when you glance and you see you know why i never see book one of this series on its spot then it might inform you like oh maybe we need more copies of that one or i better go check and see if that one's been lost too long you know so it could be holding other people up and that's the other reason I like stacking is when our book number one is gone, it leaves a little empty stand there. And then the next kid browsing knows, OK, this series looks good, but book one isn't in. So I'm going to keep browsing for something else right now or I'm going to ask to put it on hold. So lots of nice visual cues for your browsers trying stacking. You don't have to do it all. You don't have to do all the series stacking. You can just try one or two here and there and see if it works nicely for you or not. So you can see here is um, more close up pictures of some of the stacking and in the side you'll see a little video of me turning a bookcase from static shelving to dynamic shelving. So you can see it's sped up, but you can see how it's not too long of a process. Um, you can see here Demco, uh, it's a little hard to see because a lot of Demco's products are acrylic, which are beautiful and awesome in real life, but my pictures didn't pick them up too well because they're very, very clear. But you could see here Children of Blood and Bone is, is on one of these Demco clip-on shelf displays, so you could see how I clip it in front of the stacked books, and then the book just leans there, book number one, I would lean there, and then when book number one gets checked out, if we have other copies of book number one, I put them in that spot. And if we don't, then students who are browsing can easily see, okay, the, the stand is empty, so all of the book ones are gone. So they know that they have to wait a little bit. So when you get this presentation, you'll have the link to this. And these stands are really cool because they clip onto the end of the shelf, which keeps them from getting um, pushed back and pushed to the side, which I, I really like because um, despite what you might think, untidy shelves actually really bother me. So it's nice to not have to go always be straightening up all of the little book stands. <laughs> okay, another type of in-shelf um, strategy that you could try is bins. Um, libraries have been doing binning for a long time, right? This isn't new. And there may be ways to use it you haven't thought of. Um, but in general, I found that bins tend to be a really, really good strategy for if you have very deep shelves, um, if you have very thin books, like, um, you know, picture books and cha thin chapter books or comic books, the books that tend to have very, very small spines, they don't really work so well lined up in spines out because the spines are just so, so short and so tiny. Um, so I, in my opinion, that's where bins are at their strongest. It's really for the thin, thin books. Um, and it's like series of books are very high traffic areas, mm -hmm. tends to be a good spot for bins. The nice thing about bins is that it makes browsing easy because you can put the sign on the bin for what's in the bin. And then people just have to find the bin that they're interested in and then they can just dig around inside. Mm. Um, that works really nicely for young children too because you know you, you can be visual. If it's, if it's the dog bin or the dog man bin, then you put a picture uh, you know, on the outside for that and then they know exactly which bin they wanna dig through. Um, but it's nice because in high traffic areas, you know, if you have three or four bins with the high, really high traffic, high interest stuff in it, um, instead of the first five getting checked out and then all the all the other ones flopping and flapping over on the shelf and falling off the shelf, that doesn't happen because the, it's in a bin. So it does keep the shelves a little more tidy. And tidy shelves are more accessible shelves. It's hard for people to find things if books are falling all over the place and, and not, um, not easy to look through. So bins are definitely a strong contender, I would say, for the kinds of things you can try on your shelves. I am at a high school, so most of our books are bigger. And so bins um, aren't something I use in most of the library, but I have found that they work great in our comic book section. In fact, it's kind of been a lifesaver because comic books were driving me up a wall <laughs> with the constant tipping over and nobody could see which ones we had in, you know, so I actually used old, I just um, bought these really um, small magazine holder boxes, they're cardboard. 
and I just bought them and I gave each of my comic series one of those boxes. I put a little sign on the end and then it's really easy to shelve those books and for students to see how many of Fence we have in or how many of, you know, Batman books we have in or whatever. So that is a, a good strategy in my opinion for comic books. And you can see here um, two other examples of types of bins you might you might enjoy. Um, the Demco acrylic book bin, I think is awesome for picture books. We don't have too many picture books at our library since we're high school. We do have a small bookcase of them. Um, so I was able to try out the acrylic bin and you it's on the floor here. You can't really see it, but it is clear, but it, they are in a bin. And so I couldn't put this one on our bookcase because our bookcases were not the right size for it. But I wanted to see if you could fit the same amount of picture books in one of these as you could on the shelf and you could. So I thought that was really cool. So you didn't have to sacrifice shelf space in order to turn them front facing if you use these kinds of um, these kinds of shelf bins, which I thought was really neat. And then you can see here, um, graciously um, gave me permission to use this picture uh, at librarian Tamara. Um, I saw her, she shared this on Twitter and I thought these bins looked awesome. And she got these from the Dollar Tree. Um, she did, she has said that they, they do break a little, but that's some, some tape has, has worked wonders. So not a, not too big of a deal, but you could see she uses them um, for, it looks like her real thin, um, like early readers or um, early chapter books kind of. So look how tidy that is. You could see how easy kids could dig through there. Okay, now this is the one that I know a lot of people are here to see, <laughs> the front facing. So we're going to talk about give quite a few examples of different ways that you can get more front facing books in your in your cases. Um, I try every possible solution for front facing that I can and I have, you know, all my different favorites and ones that I try in different genres and so I have a lot to show you here. Why front face? Now, this idea of front facing is not new, right? I, I didn't invent front facing. We've been doing this in libraries for a long time. Um, very common, you know, to have uh, most of the books spine out, pushed to one side, and then one or two books front facing on the end of the shelf. That's a very common um, practice in libraries. And the reason why is because front facing books helps get them promoted and gets them checked out. That's why we do it. That's why bookstores do it so much. There is a reason why bookstores try to face the, the product out so much. And that is because despite the, the old saying, we actually do judge books by their covers. And we should, because people put a lot of work into the cover art of books, into putting, you know, giving books covers that really speak to their vibe and their tone and the atmosphere. And that's what a great book cover does. Is it tells you a little bit about what you can expect from the book. And that helps you make your decision when confronted with rows and rows of books. So I am a huge fan of front facing as many books as possible. And that is because it's great for promotion. It's great for passive promotion and passive readers advisory, meaning I do not have to go help students find books as often because they're able to wander the shelves and be inspired and get a little bit of a sense because of they're able to see the cover and the title and the other things we add to the shelves. So it's really great for that independent navigability, but also saving a little bit of time on the librarian. You know, we you don't have to help everyone find what they need because they're a little bit more able to find what they need. And so it doesn't mean you don't help, but you don't have to as much. So it's, you know, flipping the power a little bit over to the user. It also functions as a continuous display. And I know people see that this way that I shelve things and they think I must be good at displays, but I'm actually not good at traditional displays at all. I am very bad at remembering to put up displays. In fact, I'm always at least a week or two late putting up my monthly displays <laughs> in the library because time just whips by and I lose track of it and I'm not always ready. So I don't feel bad about that anymore because the whole library kind of functions as a display now, a continuous display, which means I don't have to feel bad if I don't have the time or the resources or the ability to get an official formal display up that month. So it is kind of nice for that too. 
It also helps give us the ability to more spotlight, you know, books that are written by authors and about people that are from, you know, systemically excluded communities like um, BIPOC authors and queer authors and disabled authors and their stories. Um, because the thing is that people tend to really go for what's familiar to them in not just with books, but in life in general, right? Humans like familiarity. And so this is why we see authors, you know, like Stephen King, you know, he's, his books are always going to circulate. They don't, he doesn't need that much promotion and marketing space on the shelf. The people that want him, they know to come find him. But there are lots of great stories that are not getting the kind of marketing that Stephen King gets. And so we can help that by utilizing as much um, promotion space as possible in the library and being very intentional about which stories we choose to highlight and spotlight in those spaces. And so whenever I have a shelf where I don't have enough room to front face every book, you know, I sometimes will have some that are spying out and I'm intentional about trying to choose to spotlight a lot of the authors and um, communities that don't get that kind of marketing. So this is something that you can really use your space intentionally to do that because it helps breed familiarity. You know, every time your students walk by the shelves, they're going to see this author or this book cover, this book cover, and that builds familiarity, which builds comfort, which builds interest. And so the more you see something, the more likely you are to pick it up and try it. That's why people always pick up the books from the bestseller list, because it's familiar to them. They've seen it on a list, right? Mm -hmm. So those are kind of my whys for front facing. So let me show you some of the ways I front face. Okay. Oh, that's the wrong way. I do apologize. Okay. This is the first, first thing I tried when I was trying to front face more books in our library. First thing I tried was using easels and bookends. This is pretty common, right? Most libraries are trying, you know, easels or, or bookends at this point. Um, I'm so sorry. My cat just changed the slide. Um, she thinks it's time to cuddle. So you can see here on the bottom left picture, um, you can see the empty, the empty bookend and then the other books propped up. They are propped up on bookends just like this metal one where you just open the book in the middle, slide the metal in the, between the pages, close the book over it, and it props it up. I like this technique a lot because it's, it's affordable. A lot of us have extra bookends, thin bookends all over the place. Um, and sometimes we have lots of extra easels all over the place. So these work really well. Now the downside to this um, bookends technique is firstly, it's not great on the spines of the books. Like I can acknowledge that. And secondly, um, it can sometimes confuse patrons. It like they think sometimes that they're not allowed to touch those books, like because it's on a special display and they pick it up and they feel the metal inside and they think, oh no, I'm not supposed to touch this. Mm -hmm. So it can take a little bit of educating. I have to let during our orientations, I have to let kids know like any book you see, you can take, just take the metal out and put it on the shelf after when you're done. That's fine. Um, so that is one consideration. The other consideration is um, if you use it on shelves that are high and people pull the book off the shelf, not knowing the metal things in there, it could fall and bump them on the head. And so um, that is something to consider and something to be aware of. Now to solve that problem, you could buy, you know, the actual proper clip on um, bookends or the cur the easels, you know, that have the little bend that um, you see all over the place. Um, those are good solutions if you want to go the kind of safer route for the book spines and your patrons. Um, so you can see here that we have just very similar to the ones I showed earlier. Um, Demco has ones in metal as well. And their clip is a little bit tighter. So if you have um, thinner shelves, those ones may clip a little a little bit better. Um, but they both clip pretty well on my two different size shelves. And they do not damage the books, which <laughs> is really nice. So I'm trying to start to swap out my my comics because the comics are a little too thin and fragile to handle my, my bookend technique. So that is front facing with bookends or easels. So lots of different options for propping your books up. Here is another one. This one I just started playing with really this year, very... Um, very um, kind of more, I was starting it last year and this year I really dug in. I, I had this idea, I went to a bookstore and I saw that they had these little thin cardboard boxes behind their books um, to prop the front faced books forward on the shelf so that it didn't get sort of overlapped by the books to the side of it. And I thought it was so weird that, you know, I couldn't 
I that nobody's selling boxes like that because I could think of a hundred librarians that would love to have stuff like that. And so I went online and actually found just empty cardboard gift boxes in the the right um, dimensions that people like sell so that brides can give like, you know, little gifts to their their brides parties and whatever. So that's what these little boxes here on the left are. And you can see um, I tipped them down to take a picture so you could see the little boxes and then I tipped them back up so you could see what it looks like on the shelf for the browser. So you can see how this allows for the front face books to be pushed up so that they're about at the same level where the spines of the other books are. Mm -hmm. So that's one strategy that I've been playing with and it's been working pretty nicely. And then the other strategy I'm trying is getting um, a long cardboard box that is goes from end to end of the shelf and then you can see underneath that box you can see that's what it looks like when the books are on there so in this case you can see that the front face books aren't pushed up to be at the same level as the spine but all the books are pushed up about five or six inches on the shelf so that's kind of better for visibility so i know i've seen people use pool noodles and tissue boxes and old chromebook boxes and <laughs> all these different things we're always looking for things to put behind our our sh books right well uh shipping boxes you know five inches by five inches get them at whatever length and then cut them down to the size you need that's my little pro tip <laughs> i've been slowly converting most of my shelves to this and uh, so far i'm really liking it um, and then another option is the more um sturdy option <laughs> and attractive which is the demco has the backstop adapters they have two different ones one is a clear acrylic very much it looks very much like the box from the last slide except it's acrylic and sturdier and then they have the other version which you it's hard to see i really tried to get a picture you could see but it has a little ledge that keeps the keeps the backstop at the edge of your shelf no matter how deep your shelf is i really like that <laughs> and you can see what that one looks like you see how close to the edge it keeps the books um and so that i i use that on the top bookcase because that's the one that's the hardest for browsers to see and I really like that that depth that it pulls it up to so those are um, again linked here so you'll be able to see that and then this okay <laughs> the blue slides you're about to get three blue slides these are like my favorite these are like my favorite tips <laughs> so I turned them blue so I would remember that these are like some of my favorites okay Zigzag displays. This I am wild about this. I have to tell you, I'm like legitimately obsessed <laughs> with this Demco zigzag display. You can see it's actually right here. Which way do I need to lean? If you can see my picture, um, it's right behind me on uh, in the video right now because uh, I I love it so much. And then I also have one in our library on one of our display tables. So the zigzag, it's cool. You could see it down here in the right corner bottom and it's it's I don't even know how to explain it it's just literally like a long piece of acrylic with these zigzag shelves and then you can put the books in and it shows off like two-thirds to one-third of the cover and so it makes for a really nice um, row of books there that all their covers get to kind of be celebrated so just another way of marketing and merchandising your books um showing your covers and just playing and having a little bit of fun calls a little bit of attention you know i think our eye as humans we tend to have our eyes snagged by things with visual interest and so you know that's why i try different things i try the clip-on book ends i try i try the book ends i try the zigzag i try the cardboard boxes i try all these different things so that when my browsers are browsing, they kind of have these little bursts of, you know, visual interest to grab them. They're like, it's not all so monotonous, you know, it doesn't all sort of blend together so much. So I like to try a lot of different things. So the zigzag displays, a huge, huge, huge fan of those. And this is another one I'm a huge fan of. I was actually super excited because a couple months ago I was at Target and I saw that in Target's book section, they had displays like this, not for sale, just that they use to promote their the books they sell. And I literally took a picture of it and I think I tweeted it and I was like, why doesn't anybody sell these? I want these, these, these little, these little proper uppers where you can put like duplicates on so that as soon as somebody checks one book out, the book behind it is the same book and it's still on display and I don't have to go redisplay these books. So here they are. <laughs> sure enough, Demco does sell sell stands like this. So this is their series display. Um, or duplicates display. 
Uh, I really like them a lot. You can see two different ways on the table here. It gives it a little bit of an angle because it props it up slightly tipped back. And on the front top, you can see when it sits on the shelf, it has the, the thing hangs over the ledge to keep it um, from getting pushed back on the shelf, which is really cool. So I'm, I'm a big fan of these. I don't use them for series. Um, but I like them a lot for duplicates because it's I don't have to go redisplay the books because when the person takes the first book off, the rest behind it are still on display. So I'm a I'm a big fan of these as well. And I like that they're attractive acrylic as well. Okay, now here's three little random front-facing tips that I like. Uh, this is another one from Demco. This one uh, is pretty cool. It, it's You don't have to drill or do any kind of um, installing. They just hang on the side of your, um, on like the end cap of your shelves. And I really like that because I'm a big believer in maximizing your space, utilizing what space you do have, displaying as much as you can by using every inch of space available to you. And for a lot of us with stacks you know the end caps are real prime real estate for for making displays um but you know sometimes you don't always going to be able to do slat you know you can do slat walls or you can install shelves on the side or whatever but they also have these which are just non-installation it's they just hang and they're pretty cool um, and pretty much all the books that i've been putting on this on the end of our classic stack <laughs> have gotten checked out like really quickly so it's definitely working uh, another tip is tilted shelves. Now, a lot of you probably are like me and you have those old magazine um, bookcases that, you know, but maybe you don't have magazine subscriptions as much anymore. And maybe you're looking at these shelves with these tilted shelves and thinking, gosh, what a waste of space. I wish, you know, I wish I could have regular bookshelves on this wall. Well, it's actually a great display space. So you can actually work, use it works great for comic books, these tilted, these tilted shelves um but comic books anything any kind of book really new books display whatever tilted shelves are really great um as well for having those front-faced books and this is a completely free tip that i was wild about again so gracious so grateful um for at kelly hinks one for letting me use this picture um, I was kind of blown away by her idea. So simple and so powerful. She uh, started putting some of her picture books just displayed on the floor, just out of the walk path and just leaning up against the bookcases. Um, you know, think about accessibility. Think about where is your audience? How can you meet your audience where they are? And the audience for a lot of our picture books are, you know, what, two feet tall, three feet tall, they're crawling on the floor. So yeah, the floor, floor can be used for display space. You know, put a stack of books on the floor, prop some books on the floor against the bookcase. It's genius to me. It's like, I was so blown away by this idea. It's so simple and it's so clever and it's so great from a user perspective. Like those little kids, they really sometimes struggle with dealing with rows of spines, you know, little hands and, um, you know, little fingers <laughs> it can be tough for them but most little kids would be able to grab some of those books from the floor pretty easily, which means they have access and that's pretty powerful. So those are some of my favorite tips and tricks for front facing. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of quickly go through the next two sections and then we'll do some hopefully questions and conversation. Um, but the other kind of way to spruce up your, you know, your shelving is using eye catchers. So you saw us from a lot of our pictures, you can see some of the things I do on our shelves. I'm kind of a color obsessed person. So you may notice that all of our shelves have color on them. I have colorful background papers behind the bookcases and colorful tape on the edges of the bookcases. Um, it's not only because I personally like color, um, but it also helps to visually chunk and demarcate the collection so that when browsers are walking down our long wall of fiction, you know, the colors help give them a visual cue that they are now looking at um, a different genre. And so it's kind of nice because I know a lot of our students very, very overwhelmed by a wall of, you know, row after row of spines and no real demarcations or, or indications of what they're looking at. So color can help with accessibility. It's also important to not rely only on it because you have to remember that there are people who, you know, may be colorblind or, you know, for one reason or another, 
you know, the color coding isn't going to help them. So it's not like a cure-all to everything, but it is something you can do to kind of add little eye catchers, like little, hey, look over here, you know, grab people's interest. Of course, you can decorate. You know, I see librarians do amazing in-shelf decoration displays and seasonal displays, like, you know, pumpkins and things, you know, near the harvest season. And um, that's, you know, there's a million different things you can do for that. You can add stuffies or related toys, you know, to your section. If you have, if your train section is really popular and you have a model train or some kind of train toy, you know, you could put it on the shelf there or on the shelf above helps catch the eye, you know, helps give a visual indication to people of where the train books are, um, or, you know, unicorn stuffed animal and put it in the fantasy section or, you know, whatever, anything to grab people's eye and give them some indications of what they're looking at. And then, of course, shelf talkers. Shelf talkers are, of course, a popular, well-loved strategy in libraries and bookstores, so that is another one that I try to rely on a lot because I really want students to be able to walk the shelves and know what they're looking at and have something to go on for making their choice. Because before I started trying all of this, I was seeing a lot of choice fatigue. You know, students would come in and just kind of glazed eyes, look at the wall, and they don't really know where to start or how to make a choice. There's no real indications, you know, so I like to use things like this to help give them something to go off of. It gives them something to bite into, right, and maybe pique their interest. Um, so you can see a couple different versions of shelf talkers that I do um, for our manga. You know, I didn't, <laughs> the manga, um, manga book series descriptions are not always very very clear and so i didn't want students to not be able to tell what the series was about so i created these little shelf talkers for each series that just has a little um like a synopsis like a little blurb for what the series in general is about that way when they're browsing they can just look for keywords to see you know from some of those that might be of interest and it helps them make choices i even put tags on it like you know action romance or whatever you know so they can have something to go off of for making their choice um, speech bubbles little bookmarks little eye grabbers you know i've seen librarians do a million different versions of these kinds of things always so many clever ideas um, i love when people use bookmarks as little eye grabbers in the books that's always fun um, this is one where i did the first line of the book it was like you know, books with great opening lines. And I just put the opening line on the speech bubble and tucked it inside. And that's because sometimes I, students don't even crack the book open. They just kind of walk and they're like, ah, nothing looks interesting. So this way they don't even have to open it. They could get the first sentence and maybe it'll catch their attention. All right. And then the kind of traditional um, shelf talkers where you kind of tuck it on the shelf and, and talk about, you know, try to get some kind of eye grabber on that. Okay, so here's your little advocacy part, and then we'll get and see if there's any questions in conversation. So here is like, if you have to, you know, make your case, or if I had to make my case to you as to why I think it might be nice to try. So my first kind of things, as I said, my first big elevator pitch would be, you know, try changing up your shelving, try dynamic shelving, you know, if you're trying to make your, your collection more accessible, you know, and you're trying to give your users more independence. That does not mean that we as the librarians are not willing or able or wanting to help, of course we are, but we can also rethink when and how that help happens. And sometimes putting a lot of our effort into the front end uh, of designing a collection that is more easily accessible, then it helps shift the power over to the users. So I just don't think our users should have to ask for help in finding what they want. I think they should usually be able to look around and easily be able to figure it out. That That's what a collection would be successful for me. I don't mind helping, and of course I'm willing to help, but I really want the collection to be something they can they can feel empowered to navigate and for my students this rows of spines they were not empowered they were feeling very frustrated and very um, confused and overwhelmed so that is kind of that argument i would make it you know we're trying to think things more accessible more user friendly sometimes it causes a little bit of a rethink for us as the librarians 
Um, maybe it's a little more complex for us, but we're trying to simplify it for them. It is also great for efficient, as I said, reader's advisory. You know, if you're doing some of these tips and tricks, you're not going to have as many potential readers walk out the door empty handed because you couldn't come over and hand book talk, hand sell to them at that moment because you had a line of other patrons that you were helping with something else. But they'll be able to have some of that passive advisory happening on the shelves with your book talkers in the front facing. Um, so that in the collection development again i have to tell you there is like almost no greater feeling for me than as soon as i reshift and redisplay a bookcase and then i walk by a little while, while later and i see those gaps those empty spaces which tells me that you know a book got you know got grabbed and got checked out it is so thrilling to me i don't know maybe i'm just a huge library nerd but it's really exciting mm -hmm. um and finally why try dynamic shelving well because it works at least it works for us <laughs> i can tell you the numbers have been dramatic for us in our library um so you can see i did a little so that you could see a comparison a uh, month-to-month -month comparison over the years and you can see um you know here's where i kind of started i started right up here and then this was the first month of 2017 2018 and now look at that jump <laughs> We genreified here in between these years and look at how many more books circulated that first month and so we're going to talk about genrefication and ditching dewey and all of that good stuff next next webinar um, and here you can see this is where our sad moment was because we were um closed virtual only and then hybrid for this year and then here during this time when we were hybrid i um, did a lot of a lot more weeding, a lot of ditching Dewey, and a lot of implementing of some of my dynamic shelving practices. And you can see that jump between when I did those things, how much our circulation increased. So it's, a, it's not only because of the shelving techniques, but it has definitely had a big, big, been a big component to it. Our kids are just more successfully finding what they want, finding things to inspire them, and they're just more empowered to navigate and find and search on their own. And it's really speaking um, in our circulation numbers, it's really showing. So it's been really exciting. All right, so here's our final tips. Um, tips, start small. You know, this is not an all or nothing situation. I think sometimes we get very overwhelmed by kind of looking at like the final product like how do i get there that's way too much you know for me to take on but you don't it's not all or nothing it, i didn't start by doing it all across the whole library you know this has been five or six years in the making of me trying little things and it building and building so like you don't have to start in the whole library trying a new shelving technique you could pick one bookcase to start on or what i did when i started trying it i actually did traditional shelving on every shelf except for the eye level shelf on each bookcase so i re shelved the whole collection leaving the eye level shelf blank and that eye level shelf on every bookcase is what i used for the front facing and the little book um, shelf talkers and all those techniques so i tried it out on one shelf per bookcase first and then it started to you know grow it down and, and weed so i could do it on more shelves and so you can start small you can start on one bookcase start on one shelf start on one table near the door or whatever start on your windowsills or whatever you know this does not have to be all or nothing you can try different techniques you know this can be fun <laughs> it doesn't have to be stressful you can just start to try and say i'm going to try this here and i'm going to try this on this shelf and we're going to see how it goes and that is perfectly fine this you know i think we kind of are used to having these traditions in our profession and it's like it's actually okay to just try different things and if they don't work then you try a different thing next month or next year you know there's no real pressure here you know you're just trying to see what's going to work use what you have you know you may have a bunch of old bins somewhere you may have old magazine holders you may have a bunch of um, bookends scattered around or this one cart that has a broken wheel that you don't really use so you could park that out near the circulation desk and do a display on it um, you know use what you have if you don't have much space 
you know, do you have, are there window ledges that you can prop books up on? You know, can you prop books up on the floor? You know, can you put a couple of books on display in the center of every single work table? You know, or whatever, what do you have? You know, focus on what you can do. Um, and look to stores for inspiration. That's what I do. I walk around bookstores and I look at all the, the ways that they promote and, and market their books. And then I'm like, oh, I wonder how we could do that. You know, I wonder if I could do a version of that in, in the library. So remember, stores, they have that market research money and they're doing market research to figure out what works. And libraries don't have that kind of market research money, but we can just kind of borrow from, you know, what the people with the market research money are doing and implement that in the library and see if it works for us too. So focusing on what you can do, I would say is really gonna be how you can manage to just sort of let yourself start to play and have a little bit of fun and be open to questioning the traditions or the things that we've always done and thinking about well, why, why am I still doing that? Is it even working? What could I try that might work better for my community? And then just start small and see what happens. So dynamic shelving, it's just about trying different things, staying flexible, focusing on what you can do to help promote your library's resources and to help make browsing and finding easier for the user. You know, whenever we keep our users front and center in our decisions and our policies and our practices, you know, it's gonna be hard to go wrong. As long as we're keeping our users' needs um, in the front and the forefront, that's gonna really help us guide, help guide us and get us going in the right direction. So thank you. You will have these slides, all the links on them you'll have, and the two blog posts that I've written so far, um, which probably have even more pictures and examples and rationale. So if you really are ready to geek out on this stuff like me, you can dive into those. And then um, we do have Save the Date, so April 27th, we are doing part two of our dynamic shelving uh, mini series, and we're gonna be thinking bigger in the next one. So we're gonna be looking at the big changes you can make to your collections, you know, the weeding, the dynamic, or the uh, ditching Dewey, genrefication, pulling your comics out or your poetry out of nonfiction, and those kind of bigger, bigger moves you might be ready to make or you might be thinking about trying, so. That will be coming up later in April. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelsey. We did get a lot of questions and some awesome comments and suggestions as well. So we do have just about eight minutes left. I'll try to uh, pull out a couple. There was a lot about weeding and um, I'm assuming every library is a different size. So it's hard to quantify the amount of weeding that needs to happen. Uh, but do you have any information about approximately how many titles or books per student for your student body or like the size of your library and how much you weeded to give people an idea of that? Yeah, and we will talk about weeding in the next presentation too, but yeah, weeding is it's going to have to happen for you to have the display space. Um, what I will say is that I think almost always we can weed a lot more than we are comfortable with or want to. And so I would say almost always my advice would be to weed more. And I would also say that at least for me, um, I know that the library organizations have released like, like at least in Pennsylvania, it's supposed to be 25 books per student or something. I will tell you that I do not abide by those numbers because they were created, I do believe, before digital resources were so common. And so in, physical collections are a little different now because like we do not need to have the 16,000 reference nonfiction we used to have because we have a quite a robust database subscription um, collection for our research needs. And so that has shifted in my opinion what the books per student ratio should be. And so uh, I think the number can be much, much lower than the previous standard when you take into account your digital resources, because you know we have millions of articles in our databases that, that that's gonna skew the numbers if it were physical on their shelves, then we would well have enough of the, our books per student. So I will say that I think rethinking some of those policies and practices um, with the modern age may help you get to the weeding point where you need to be. Um, and then again, you start small and you, you know, pick one section or one genre and see how, how much you can get it weeded. 
Great, thank you. And then we also had some questions about if you recommend doing genification before starting this process. And when you have students that come in that do specifically know what they're looking for and you've already done either dynamic shelving or genrification, how are you helping their student find that if it maybe fits into a couple different categories? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked that question because I think that's a really common question. Um, there is no difference for my students. If, if they know what they want, they still find it the same way they always did. They search it in the catalog, they get the call number, and then they look at the signs to find the call number on the shelf. And so there's no difference there. The only thing this has changed is for the browsers, the people who don't know what they want. It makes it much, much easier for them. But it doesn't really make it any harder for the people that do know what they want because it's the same process for them. So if a student wants, um, you know, a one of the Rick Reardon books or whatever, they don't know where it is, they're going to put it in the get the call number. It's going to say fantasy Reardon. And then they go to the fantasy section to the R's for Reardon. So that's still A to Z order within the genres and within the dynamic shelving. Um, so it, it hasn't really changed anything. Um, we will talk about, I want to save the genre question genrefication questions more intensely for the next one because it, that's going to be one of the big focuses. Okay, great. Thank you. And then would you ever um, tackle nonfiction with dynamic shelving? Or what I have recommend? actually, I do. I didn't realize until you just said it that I didn't include any pictures in this presentation of nonfiction, but our nonfiction looks exactly the same as our fiction. That's mostly front faced with um, lots and lots of signage. In fact, you'll see that next week because we're going to talk about Dishing Dewey and you'll see, or next month you'll see, um, our nonfiction looks very much like that. So yes, I have, and it's been, it's been really great. Great. And then do you do any sort of training to familiarize faculty or students and how much time do you do that and when do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so our users, faculty and students, they really don't need any training because again, the library just still functions the same for them, just easier. So they still come in and they know they can look around and they see all the signs that tells them fantasies here, sci-fi's here, whatever. Um, and then if they need a specific book, they know how to use the, the catalog just as always. So I haven't had to do any kind of specific training with my users. Um, other than the normal ninth grade orientation that they always get, you know, which is still just like, here, this is a library, here's how it works, you know. Um, but the our library assistant, the people that shelf, that's really the ones that have needed like training because it's a totally different way on our end of shelving things. And so that is kind of where the training need came in. And we had a new assistant this year, so I did get to do a proper training for her. And so it wasn't too complicated, I mean, shelving a John Fred library is not hard because it's so chunked up and then I've been working with her through some of the different techniques that I just showed you basically um you know and and then she she plays with it as well and tries some of her you know she tries her version of stacking or um or whatever so yes but that part does take obviously a little training because it is different than just putting them in a rows of spine so you know I just worked with I showed like a couple examples and then you know she tried it and then we went from there but the users haven't they took to it like water there was really no training needed for them but for the workers a little bit of training for sure great and then we'll do this last question here um, do you have any thoughts on the drawback of the loss of anonymity in browsing um, particularly within the school so you've got students that are now finding books by genre or through dynamic shelving and it's maybe less private than how they would normally find a book Oh no, I don't I don't I wouldn't think that that's an issue at all. I mean, we don't use rainbow stickers or anything. We don't have like a we don't have all of our books with queer rep in one section. I think maybe that's where this question is going and that's not I would not do that because that would be a huge loss of privacy for sure. Um but, you know, ALA and the profession and best practices does not recommend and that we have genres or physical labels that uh, are tied to identity information. And so there's really not much, I mean, somebody is browsing a fantasy section or a sci-fi section, I, I don't think there's a considerable loss of privacy there. Now, obviously it would be if they were browsing, 
you know, if they had, they could only find books with queer authors in the queer author section, then that would be a significant loss of privacy. And so I, I would not create a section like that. Um, displays, yes, but not every single book <laughs> you have to go to this section for. Um, so no, I don't think there's a loss of privacy at all. I think we have way more students actually being able to find books they're interested in. And so it's, it's not a downside that I've noted or had any um, students bring up, you know, that there hasn't been an issue, luckily. But, you know, you always want to be thinking about that. And that, that does, choosing your genres is important if you're going to genreify so that you are making sure you're not, you know, forcing people to disclose information about themselves that they shouldn't have to disclose to find a book. Great. Well, we are right at four o'clock. I, again, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I'll remind everyone that an email will go out in about a week that has a link to these resources, which will have links to the Demco products that were shown, as well as a recording of this webinar. And we will have another one obviously coming up next month. So thank you very much, Kelsey, uh, for your time and your energy and your expertise and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming and hanging with me today. It's been great. Awesome.